Last week, I'm still just like on a spiritual high from last week. It was so, I mean, who was here just last week just still amazed at what God was doing? Amen. God was on the move. And, uh, and he's still on the move, my friends. He is still on the move. I'm so thankful. Listen, we want to let you know today comes an end of an era. Today is the last day your kids will be in the tent. Because next week begins in-person child care ministry. Woohoo! Yes. So next week we begin our in-person ARC Anthem Ranger Kids ministry. I know they announced it, but uh, we are looking forward to that. Probably not as much as you're looking forward to that. Uh, but we have had a great time. And I wanted just to say thank you, parents. Thank you, parents. I know it's not easy to have your kids sitting on your lap, and marie you know. I know it's not easy, Mr. Lynch, to bring a picnic table every single Sunday for your kids, you know. I know it's not easy. Uh, but I think God has done something very unique and very special this past year. Amen? I just believe it. It's been sweet. You know, Ranger Rhett and worshiping and all these different things. I mean, it's been so much fun to have kids uh, in this tent with us experiencing this is church this is mom and dad lifting up their hands to jesus it's been so much fun and we want to kind of continue that That's, there's still going to be times when we want to be all together in fact not to talk too much about it but the new kind of program we are going to have them doing kids ministry in the parking lot kind of how we did for easter but we actually had decided for the worship time we actually going to have our kids with us for worship and then we're going to dismiss them to class afterward. Yeah, I think that's going to be awesome. So we want them to be a part of that. And also, just a little, little bonus, if you want to volunteer, that's actually less time for you in the classroom. Because they're going to worship here, and then to go with you, it's a little bit less time. It's just teaching and hanging out, making a craft, stuff like that. So volunteer. We need volunteers. And uh, make moms and dads so happy by kicking their kids out of the tent. Just kidding. Listen, if we have never been introduced, my name is Nate have the privilege of being one of the pastors here at this church. We believe God's given us a vision, a mission to proclaim the name of Jesus. That's what we're always going to always be about, proclaiming the name of Jesus, that all would look to him and be saved. Our desire is to learn how to love and live just like Jesus did. Jesus is our anthem. He's the cry of our heart. He's the song that we sing. He's the flag that we plant. Jesus is our anthem. So thank you for joining us this morning. Open your Bibles to Acts chapter 1. We are beginning a brand new collection of sermons titled The Viral Church. Ooh, you like that. The Viral Church. If you want to follow along on uh, my study notes, you go to the Version Bible app, and I'll have some uh, notes there for you to follow along, some cross-references and things like that. If you are here, a student, and you... Uh, Fill out those study notes, come to me, and we'll give you a little gift card for following, following along and paying attention. By the way, students, I know Westmont, Westmont's almost over, right? Westmont's almost over. You, yeah, you ladies looking good. So what we want to do for the, um, I think, I mean, and UCSB is coming. UCSB, I talked to some students. You got like another month left. Sorry, gauchos. I feel for you. But uh, for those in college, next Sunday, we're going to have for you a little finals prep kit with some snacks, some little goodies, maybe a little devotion in there. So be coming here to church next Sunday. We'll have a little gift for you uh, to prepare you, maybe like a Red Bull energy drink, who knows what's in there, uh, to bless your time. Uh, but uh, what was I talking about? I don't know what I'm talking about. Okay, Acts chapter 1, version Bible study notes, viral church. Does anybody know what the first viral video was on YouTube? To go viral means to spread rapidly, to to go from place to place, to be contagious, if you will, kind of like the, something called the coronavirus, something that is contagious, that spreads rapidly. Did a little research. The very first YouTube video that went viral, that spread rapidly and quickly, anybody know it? That's it, the dance, the evolution of dance. If you've ever seen it, you've got to Google it. Kids, don't Google it now. It's church time. But evolution of dance, at the time, it was the first year that YouTube was kind of... Uh, open or around uh, 2006 and it had over 308 million views very rapidly and it had 1.5 million comments on it the second most viral video anybody know what that one is igor which one dance two no charlie bit my finger remember that one 
Charlie bit my finger. That has been viewed. That was that came out the second year of YouTube was around 2007. It has right now has 880 million views, 2.3 million comments. There's videos now that are higher, but at the time, those were the first viral videos. I did some research too on how to make an Instagram post go viral, looking at the top five ways to make an Instagram post go viral. You can do a lot of research on this. You can be stuck in the internet for a long time researching this. Uh, one is they tell you to understand your audience. Who's following you? Who are you following? Understand the audience. What are they into? What would they like? What would they think is important? The second thing that you said is find your unique voice. What's your personal point of view? What's your unique take on something? And if you add those two things with the third one, which is you have to like actually comment and engage with people, which I actually never do, unfortunately. And, um, and if you do those things, your post just might go viral. Viral. To spread rapidly, to be contagious. Well, our next few weeks, these next few months, as we look at the book of Acts, the book of Acts is just that. It's about a church going viral. It's about the movement of the church. It's about something that began small in an upper room in a little city called Jerusalem that within 30 years would spread from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. The viral church, the movement of what God's people are all about. The book of Acts is about ordinary people equipped with the word of God, empowered by the spirit of God, dedicated to the Son of God to accomplish the mission of God. And what we're going to do for these next few weeks ahead of us is we're going to see really what is the church? How can it be viral? How can we be a part of a church that is viral, that is contagious, that is growing, that is a movement, not a monument, if you know what I'm saying. So we're going to see in chapter 1, these first few verses, we're going to see really the blueprint for going viral. What are the necessary ingredients for a church to go viral? And we're going to be anchored in verse 8. But we're going to see three things, the power, the purpose, and the plan this morning. Acts chapter 1, here we go. We'll read a few verses together. Verse 1 says this. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given commandments through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. Verse 3, he presented himself alive, alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Verse 5, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Verse 6, so when they had come together, the disciples had come together, they asked him, Lord, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, look, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Here it is, verse 8, the anchor of the book of Acts, the anchor of our verse today. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth. And when he said these things, as they were looking at him, he was lifted up. And a cloud, a cloud took him out of their sight. And verse 10 says they were kind of dumbfounded while they were just gazing into heaven as he went. Behold, two men stood by them in white robes. They said, men of Galilee, why are you standing around looking up into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up into heaven, he's going to come in the same way just as you saw him go into heaven. Ooh, this is God's word for us this morning. Would you join me as we pray over our time? Oh, Father, we thank you for this moment. Uh, to gather together. There is joy in the house of the Lord today. Amen. We're so blessed to be here. And we pray, Lord, your word would speak with power and precision, that it would accomplish what it needs to accomplish. Lord, I love to think about this idea that you've drawn men and women, young and old, single and married, kids for all over to this place today, not by happenstance, but for a purpose. And you're going to speak. You're going to give direction. You're going to give encouragement. You're going to give correction. Lord, you're going to, I think, there's even salvation here today. You have your way with us, Lord. Not my word, but your word spoken in this tent this morning. And all God's people said, amen. 
Amen. Well, before we kind of talk about the power, the purpose, and the plan, let's spend just one moment with a little bit of a preview. What is the book of Acts all about? And you know how I love little, little gimmicks here. The ABCs of the book of Acts, okay? The ABCs. A, who is the author of the book of Acts? Who knows? Yell it out to me. Luke, right? Luke is the author. Watch the text, verse 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began. So, most commentators believe that who I have, who this first, who they're talking about is the guy named Luke. Luke was a companion of Paul. Luke was a physician. Uh, Luke was the one who wrote the gospel of Luke. And most would say these Luke and the book of Acts kind of originally were one kind of unit together. Our kind of Bible now separates them a little bit. Luke's one of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, then Acts. And so the author is Luke. We also think about, so then A is the author, Luke. B, look at verse, look at the verse, what it says. I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do. Began. The book of Acts is about a continuing work of Jesus Christ. See, we do not worship a dead teacher, right? Verse 3 says he presented himself alive. Jesus is alive. So we know the book of Acts is all about things that Jesus began to do. It reminds us that Jesus is not done doing, right? He's still at work in the world, amen? We saw that last week. His work continues through the people of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. So A is the author, is Luke. B reminds us that it's about Jesus beginning his work and is continuing to go. And then C reminds us that this is all about the birth of the church. The book of Acts is about the birth of the church, the mission and vision of the church. It describes the movement and how it grows. Now, here's what we need to do before we begin our series is we need to ask this question. Many people wonder this. The book of Acts, is it prescriptive or descriptive? You're thinking, Pastor Nate, what are you talking about? Well, prescriptive, is this the case? Is the book of Acts telling us what the church should do? It's prescriptive. It's prescribing to us how church should look. Or is it descriptive? Is it just telling us what the church did? describing to us what the church did at that time. Now, I would say that it's a little bit of both. I would say it's both prescriptive, it's telling us what church should be, but it's also descriptive, it's telling us how church was. Some people would say, well, the book of Acts, it tells us the, the church should look just like the church of uh, the book of Acts. Well, I would say, all right, well, I think there's sometimes when it's just describing what was going on. Like, for instance, do you remember how they chose the replacement for Judas when Judas had hung himself? The disciples put a bunch of names in a hat, shook it up, and said, who's going to be next? Boom, Matthias. All right, he's our next guy. Now, personally, that's not how we choose, like, small group leaders. We don't put a bunch of names in a hat and say, okay, who's going to be the next small group leader? Okay, Tom Smith, you know. Um, that's not how we don't do it that way, right? So there's, you know... Book of Acts talks about Paul, uh, Peter's shadow just, you know, crossing over people and they're being healed. Peter, uh, Paul, oh no, Peter, Paul had a little handkerchief that people would use to be healed. Like, I don't have a handkerchief ministry, you know, like we're not doing that. So there's some things that I think are just descriptive. It's just telling you this is how it happened back then. But there's some things when you read in the book of Acts that you're like, no, 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 this is prescriptive. This should, just, this, this should be what our church looks like. Right, Acts 2.42, what were they doing, man? They were just together daily. They were reading. They were talking about the apostles teaching. They were fellowshipping. They're breaking bread. They're praying. Hey, I want to be about a church. I want church to look like that. So it has both. It has both. And I think it will be clear as we move on what is being prescriptive, what should we look like, and what is just being descriptive, what did it look like then. Does that make sense? So as we think about that, the ABCs of the book of Acts. So I'll look at verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, uh, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? So Jesus has been risen from the grave. We read that he's around for like 40 days, coming and going, interacting. And at this moment, it must have been day 40, it looks like. And he's with a disciple. He's going to talk to them. And they say they still didn't quite get it. They're thinking, okay, Jesus, you, you were buried. Uh, you died. You were buried. You rose again. So now must be the time when your earthly kingdom is going to come and you're going to kick out Rome and we're going to rule and reign. Is, is this the time for this now? 
They still were missing it. In verse 7, what do they say? Jesus says, listen, it's not for you guys to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Notice he doesn't say that's not going to happen, so there is going to be a ruling and reigning of Jesus. He doesn't say that's the wrong idea. That's going to happen, but he says it's not, that's not what you're supposed to be about right now. Like, don't worry about that. Here's what you should worry about, verse 8. This is your command. This is my commission to you. This is the mission. I'm telling you, you're going to receive power, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So we're going to camp out here for the next few moments. Verse 8 really gives us the mission of the church, what we should be all about, how to go viral is right here. First, you notice the word power. You saw that there in verse 8. Look again. You will receive power, power. Look to your neighbor and say, power. I mean, you don't have a microphone, so you can't have the powerful P like I got it. Power, you know, power. The Greek word there is the word dunamis, and it just means that. It means dynamic. It means dynamite. It means to be super, to be uh, big and booming. For the church to go viral, for the church to spread, it was going to need some power. For anything to move forward, it needs power to get going, right? And Jesus knew that the disciples then and the disciples now, you and me, would need a power source to accomplish his mission that he gave us. Now, the question number one we ask, we got to ask ourselves is, well, where does this power come from? Like, what's he talking about? Where, where does this power come from? Verse 8 says this. So you see that there? You're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So where does the power come from for us to accomplish the mission God's given us? It comes from the Holy Spirit. It comes from outside of ourselves. That's why he says you've got to receive power. It's not your own power. You're going to be given power outside of yourself. The Holy Spirit's going to give it to you. Well, who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not an it. <laughs> Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is not a force like Star Wars, right? Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit has a mind. Here's a few verses to, to, for you to write in the margin of your Bible. Romans 8 and verse 7 talks about the Holy Spirit has a mind. Has a mind. He thinks. Romans 15, 30 talks about the idea that the, Rome, uh, the Holy Spirit can give and receive love. He can give and receive love. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 11 talks about the Holy Spirit giving gifts to men and women. He has the ability to choose. has the ability to give. We read in Scripture that the Holy Spirit can teach. Holy Spirit can be grieved. The Holy Spirit gives guidance. So the Holy Spirit is not an it. Holy Spirit is a person. Well, what does the Holy Spirit do? What is the role of the Holy Spirit? Now, this is where people get a little freaky, get kind of scared. Because some people think too little of the Holy Spirit. A little bit too scared. Like, well, what does it mean, Holy Spirit? Like, Father, Son, and Holy Word. Yeah, 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 that's what we like. There's other people that think too much of the Holy Spirit, and they elevate him to a status that he himself doesn't even want because he's always about making much of Jesus. So what is the role? What does the Holy Spirit do? And I've always thought about it in three, three roles of the Holy Spirit. And I think it will help us as we begin this series in the book of Acts. John 14, verse 17 says this. Jesus says this, speaking of the Holy Spirit. He says, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Speaking of the Holy Spirit and his role in your life of a believer, John, Jesus says, you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. So that first idea is that the Holy Spirit dwells with you. The Greek word para. It means to come alongside Paraclete, to be alongside someone, to be walking shoulder in shoulder, to lead, to guide, to uh, help, help, kind of woo you into submission to God. So Holy Spirit role, number one, is to come alongside you, to come with you, to partner with you. Another role of the Holy Spirit we read in John 14, 17 says that he also comes in you. He will be in you. This is a little bit different. In you. Meaning this, we believe scripture teaches at the moment of salvation, when you, young, old, man, woman, student, retired, when you confess faith in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, there is that, at that moment, 
the Holy Spirit comes in you and dwells inside of you and begins to change and produce the fruits of the Spirit and convict you and change you. He comes in you. So the Holy Spirit comes alongside you. He's with you. Holy Spirit comes in you. And what we see here in verse 8 of Acts 1, another role, the third role of the Holy Spirit, is do you see that there, what he says? He says, and the Holy Spirit will come upon you, upon you, upon you. This is the Greek word epi, epi. It has the idea of falling on someone. It has the idea of, of you know, kind of covering you up. In fact, one, another verse to have in the margin of your Bible, Luke 24, verse 49, Luke says this about this. Uh, and behold, Jesus says, I behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you, until you are clothed with power from on high. So the Holy Spirit's role, he comes alongside you. He's dwelling in, in you. And he also can come upon you. Now, I, I thought about an illustration, and, and it might be distracting, but I'm going to ask my son, Bo, to come up here. Bo, would you mind coming up? And Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great, yeah, come on, Bo. My kids get $5 if I ever ask them to do stuff, and uh, he's got $5 coming his way. Come on in, Bo. So uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he, he's an author. He was a doctor, a great preacher, wrote lots of great books. He kind of talked about this idea of the Holy Spirit coming upon someone, and I thought about it this way. Maybe we'll come down here, Bo. Come down here. Let's go in the front like this. So it's like this. You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's as if you're now holding hands with the Father. Everyday Christian living is just holding hands with your Heavenly Father. You're walking together. You're enjoying each other's company. There is a level of intimacy. There's a level of, of closeness and connection. Everyday Christian living, just walking day by day, hand in hand with your Heavenly Father. But there are moments in your life when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And it's as if this, I'm going to try to do this. It's as if, ooh, yes, your Heavenly Father picks you up. And, and there's, just a, there's a closeness. There's, there's, there's just an intimacy. <laughs> there's just a joy. It's just, something, it's just something different. Now, I can't do this all day. <laughs> the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and there's just this moment, yes, yes. <laughs> and then the Father sets you back down, and you're back hand in hand with him. Thank you, Bo. Great job. That was awesome. Give a round of applause for Bo. Everyday Christian living is walking hand in hand with Jesus. Let me tell you, that takes courage. That's just simple obedience. That's just daily living in his presence. Obedience always takes courage. Obedience is always fruitful, just walking hand in hand. But the idea of the Holy Spirit coming upon you, coming upon you, it's when those moments, when you suddenly, you just sense there is a deeper connection there's just something clothing you, something overwhelming you, something coming upon you. It's like you're just being wrapped up in the love of the Father and His presence and His power. It's just something radical. Many of you experienced that on Sunday, last Sunday. We're just worshiping, we're baptizing, and uh, Laura Newton just mentioned that was what kind of happened. She's back there, and there was just a moment when the Holy Spirit, I would say, came upon her, and, and she felt compelled Today's my day to be baptized. Today's the day, and, and, and she was just clothed with power, and the Holy Spirit came upon her, and she gave her the power to stand up, gave her the power to come forward and say, hey, I'm wearing jeans and my church shirt, but I'm getting in that water today. That's the, an example. Power comes upon you. Now listen, it's not necessarily an everyday always kind of thing, just like I couldn't keep holding up my son. Here's the thing. I love the supernatural. I love the supernatural. In the book of Acts, there's a lot of supernatural things that happen in it. Miracles and healings. And friends, I, I desire to see the supernatural. I want to see miracles. I want to see healings. I believe the gifts of the Spirit are for today. In fact, I, I, you've witnessed a miracle. Anytime a heart of stone becomes a heart of flesh, that's a miracle, friends. Anytime someone with the power of the Holy Spirit recognizes, I am a sinner in need of a Savior, that's a miracle. That's a miracle. And so we want to see the supernatural. But listen, let me just tell you something. The supernatural events, they don't sustain faithfulness. 
I don't believe the book of Acts is primarily about gifts and wonders and signs and supernatural. It's really about the church going viral. And the people of God are endued with the power of God in order to proclaim the message of God. Supernatural events don't sustain faithfulness. Supernatural uh, has never anchored anyone in long-term faithfulness. Just recollect Old Testament when Israel crosses the Red Sea. I mean, that was a supernatural moment, right? Like, here's Moses, here's the nation of Israel. They've just left Egypt. They're coming to the Red Sea. Moses says, you know, boom, part, and the Red Sea parts. And they walk across dry ground. Supernatural moment, would you say? I mean, a miracle, right? Gnarly, gnarliness. Okay, 30 days later, what are they doing? They're making a gold calf, worshiping it, and saying, that's the God that rescued us. Supernatural does not sustain faithfulness. Only Jesus does that. Only Jesus does that. And so we as a church, I, I desire, I want to see supernatural. I want to see, I want the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon me more and more and more in my life. But what's even more courageous is just simply walking hand in hand with Jesus. Simple obedience day by day by day. Amen. And so we see that. And I pray if you're here today and you've never, you've never experienced that moment of the Father bringing you up in his arms, a sense of the Holy Spirit coming upon you in power and freshness, I want you to know you can pray for that. You can desire that. And friends, you can expect that to happen. In fact, as we end our message this morning into prayer time, we're going to have the prayer team, our elders, some leaders that's going to be praying for you. And if that's you, and you're like, you know what? I've actually never experienced the Holy Spirit coming upon me. I've never sensed that closeness with the Father. Oh, what, what, could that happen to me? We want to pray for you. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for that for you. Don't miss that opportunity. I want to pray for a heightened awareness and an increase in my affection to use us in profound ways to see his kingdom come. Amen? Last two points, the purpose. The purpose. So we have the power, or what's the power for? What's the purpose of the power? Verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. So watch the text there. See how many times the word you comes up? How many times do you see the word you? Right? Three times. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be. Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't work around you. He works through you. God is, in the work in the, God is at work in the world through you. Individually, God's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you a sphere of influence. God's using your story for his glory. God uses you per, individually. God uses us corporately as a body, as a faith family of believers. Through our tithes and our offering, through our sending out of missionaries, through our world vision, we're going to be together. We're going to advance the kingdom of God corporately as well. So there's a purpose. God wants to use us individually, corporately. But watch the text. He says, you will be my witnesses. Be my witnesses. Now, a witness is someone who does these two things, in my estimation. A witness is someone that declares a truth and displays a life. A witness, the purpose of the power is that we would be a witness. We would declare a truth and display a life. We would declare a truth that God so loves the world that he would give up his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We declare a truth that God is good and he loves you so much. He would die for you. That he would die your death so you could live his life. A witness is someone who declares that truth. Amen? But a witness is also someone that displays a life. Displays a life. Galatians 2.20. I love this verse. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. A witness is someone that displays the life of Jesus. My life is lived in such a way that I want to reveal Jesus. So that's the purpose of the power, is that we would be a witness for Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3, we read that the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to say that Jesus is Lord. So therefore, we're going to live, I'm going to live my life quite differently than the rest of the world. Because Jesus is Lord, there are things that I do not do because Jesus is Lord. 
There are places that I go because Jesus is Lord. There are places that I don't go because Jesus is Lord. There are things that I say because Jesus is Lord. There's things that I don't say because Jesus is Lord. There's a way that I spend my money because Jesus is Lord. There's a way that I don't spend my money because Jesus is Lord. There's a way that I think because Jesus is Lord. There's a way that I don't think because Jesus is Lord. Jesus says, I've asked you to be my witness. You're declaring a truth. You're displaying a life. And so our life is to reveal Jesus. Jesus, you are Lord. And, I'm, and I want my life to reflect you. And i got to confess, sometimes I do a good job. Sometimes I do a bad job. Sometimes I, I think I'm a good witness for Jesus. The way that I say, the way that I think, the things that I'm doing, I think, all right, I'm giving Jesus a good name today. But sometimes I, I just confess my, my witness is not so good. The way that I react to my wife or to my kids, the way that I treat my neighbors, sometimes I, I don't think I'm that good of a, a witness. But the idea, the purpose, the way the church goes viral is when you and me recognize we are to be a witness. We are to, to declare a truth, to display a life all for the sake of Jesus. Now, what's the plan? Like, how is this going to actually happen? Like, we have the power, the Holy Spirit power upon us. We've been given this purpose to be a witness. Well, what's the plan? Like, how does this happen? Again, verse 8. I want you to be my witnesses, the last part. And I want you to be my witness in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So how is the church supposed to move forward? Well, Jesus gives us the plan. I want you to start telling the disciples to start in Jerusalem, start in your hometown. Then I want you to, as in the concentric circles, go to Judea. And then I want you to go to Samaria. And ultimately, I want you to go to the ends of the earth. Uh, many believe that this little statement actually gives us an outline for the whole book of Acts. That Acts chapters 1 through 7 is the disciples talking and in, in, in being witnesses in Jerusalem. Then Acts 8, chapters 8 through 12 is the disciples being witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And then chapters 9 through the end through 28 is the disciples being witnesses to the ends of the earth. It starts with your neighbors. It spreads to the nations. It starts with your neighbors. It spreads to the nations. Jesus' work continues through you to the ends of the earth. He wants you to be a witness. We must remember that God has an incredible power to redeem the lost. That if a person believes that Jesus died, was buried, and rose again for the sake of sinners, that they can enter into the kingdom of God. And everyone must believe this to be saved. But anyone can believe this and be saved. And no one is beyond God's reach to bring them into this belief in order that they can and might be saved. So friends, Jesus, he loves your neighbor and has called you to be his witness to them. Jesus loves the person across the street, across the tracks, the person that lives in the other side of town that doesn't look like you or talk like you or vote like you or think like you. And Jesus has called you to be his witness to them. Jesus loves the over 3 billion unreached people groups that have zero or little access to the gospel. And he's called you to be his witness to them. That's how the church goes viral, friends, is that he uses you. He uses me. Gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness for him, to declare a truth, to display a life that the church might reach to the ends of the earth. So we are to be a, a witness here. We are to be a witness there. As a church, as we come to a close and the worship team comes up, as a church, as a leader, we've been praying this year how to be a, just a more missional church. We believe we're, this is our fourth year to exist. A third of, our year, a third of our existence has been in a pandemic. But God's been so good. He's been so faithful to us. And we've been praying. We've been asking ourselves, how can we as a church, how can we be more missional? How can we be a witness here? How can we be a witness there? And so this, early this year, we created a missions team, uh, men and women that have a heart to just, to just be on mission for Jesus. And we've been asking them, could you just pray? What does it look like for Anthem Chapel to be a witness? What does it look like for Anthem Chapel to send out missionaries? What does it look like for us to, to, 
to plant churches. Like, could it be a church plant could plant churches? I hope so. What can it look like? We believe last year God gave us this vision, right? Deep roots bearing fruit. Deep roots bearing fruit. Oh, Lord, what's the fruit that you want to see? What do you want us to do? How can we be a part of this? How can we be more mission-minded? How can we be a witness here? How can we be a witness there? I just wonder, what would it look like if we were known as a church that sends out its best and its brightest out to the mission field? I just wonder, what would it look like? Could it be if an actual tribe or, or nation or, or people group that has never heard the gospel but here's about Jesus, because a little church that meets in a tent in Galita began to have a passion to proclaim the name of Jesus and took radical steps not to build our kingdom, but to build his kingdom. Could it be? Could that be possible, church? Could that be something that we would be able to see? People coming into the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, so what's it going to be this morning, friends? Jesus has called us to be part of this viral church. I love church. I love gathering. I love seeing your faces. I love being. There is joy in the house of the Lord. But we got to always remember, we're not here just to sit and get fatter and fatter, right? Just, oh, I'm just eating God's word. Yeah. No, no, no. We are, we are designed. We're designed to be witnesses. We're designed to declare the truth of the gospel. We're designed to display the life of Jesus, to reveal him to our neighbors and to the nations. So what's it going to be, church? How's God want to use you? We are coming into, students are coming into the close of their school year. We're coming into summer months. But just because it's summertime doesn't mean it's lazy time. How's God want to use you? How does he want to use your witness? How does he want to use your family? I'll just confess to you, my own little family, my own little neighborhood, it's been hard to be a good neighbor lately. I think I mentioned to you we had those Easter signs. We put them in our front yard, and it really stirred up a lot of, let's just say, opposition in our beautiful little neighbor that we live in. It's been hard to be a good neighbor. It's been hard to be a good witness because I, ha I haven't wanted to be. But if I, have, if I have to say, as we did last week, I'm all in for Jesus. And as Jesse even mentioned, should we not always, or Laura even mentioned, shouldn't we always look as though we've just stepped out of a baptism? <laughs> shouldn't we always have that aroma of Jesus Christ upon us? Shouldn't we always just be so filled with the Holy Spirit that we are able to declare the truth and display the life? Oh, I hope so. So would you stand with me this morning? Maybe you're here today and you just want more, Jesus. You just want to be all in again. You just maybe even want to experience the power of the Holy Spirit. We would love to pray for you, pray over you. The prayer team is going to be kind of over there in the shade, and, and they would love to just encourage you. They would love to just know what's going on in your life and pray for you. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you are. You've always had maybe this desire to, to be on mission, to be more mission-minded, to maybe even be a missionary. We'd love to pray for you. Love to get behind you. What could that look like? Oh, I believe God has big plans for our church. I'm looking forward to going through this book with you guys, the viral church. So thankful to be a part of this beautiful faith family. I love to see your faith. I'm so encouraged by the way that you are on display for Jesus. I love hearing the stories of how God's using you as you preach the gospel, as you uh, uh, share the love of Jesus to your neighbors and beyond. And I believe God has great things in store for us. And so, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this moment. We just ask as we spend just a moment in response. There's some of us here that need to respond in repentance. We need to respond for being selfish with our time, talent, and treasure. And we need to once again maybe just release the grasp that we have on our own life and say, all right, Jesus, I'm all in for you. I'm all in for you. Father, maybe there's some here this morning that just want to rededicate their life to you and say, you know what, Jesus, I've been living on my own for my own glory, for my own purpose, for my own plan. And once again today, I just release that and say, your life, my life is yours, my life is yours, my life is yours. And for those here who really want a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would just come upon them in sweet intimacy and power. Oh, will that happen, Lord? Can we see that happen even now? Oh, Lord, we believe it, we believe it. Father, have your way with us this morning. Have your way here with us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to sing one worship song. Prayer team is here. Let's spend some moments in just response to our King today.